Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Carlita Gatsi, and I'd like to welcome you all to Ask the Expert, Couples with ADHD Creating Caring Connection Amid the Chaos, presented by Dr. Carol Robbins. Today's webcast is presented to you by Chad as part of the National Resource Center on Ask the Expert series. The NRC is funded by the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention and provides reliable science-based information about current medical research and ADHD management. During this webinar, we would love to hear from you, so if you have any questions or need to share a comment at any time during our presentation, feel free to do so. Dr. Robbins will answer questions after the presentation has been completed. Also, there is a box that you'll notice on the screen that's labeled resources. There you'll be able to download the slides for today's presentation. If we don't get to your question today, please know that we have health information specialists that are available Monday through Friday between 1 and 5 p.m. Eastern Time. You can always reach them at 1-800-233-4050. And now about today's presenter. We have Dr. Carol Robbins. She is with the Chesapeake ADHD Center of Maryland and is also a clinical director of the Annapolis ADHD Center. Dr. Roberts has served as a coordinator of the Anne Arundel County, Maryland chapter of CHAD since 2002. She has given numerous presentations on ADHD and has been invited to speak at several national and international conferences. She is a recent past president of the Maryland Psychological Association and the coordinator of the MPA Postdoctoral Institute on ADHD Across the Lifespan. Dr. Roberts is also a licensed provider of COGMEG Working Memory Training and trained Imagio Relationship Therapist. Personally, she is married to an ADHD spouse and is raising two children also with ADHD. Please welcome today the presenter, Dr. Carol Roberts. If you will, please begin our presentation. And tricks and strategies to help you to communicate more effectively with your partners. And these tricks are helpful pretty much for any couple, but especially taking into consideration some of the challenges that we see with ADHD. So let's dive right in. I have lots to cover with you, and I look forward to your questions at the end as well. So I will begin with an overview of our talk and um, an outline of what I'm going to be presenting. So the first thing we're going to do is to talk about ADHD and how it impacts relationships and some of the neurological related deficits and um, communication difficulties that come about because of the difference in the brain. And then we're going to talk about Imago Relationship Therapy and the principles of it, which I have found to be profoundly useful in working with couples in which one or both have ADHD. And part of that is learning the couple's dialogue process and some variations of the couple's dialogue, which I will be going into in more detail later. And then I'm going to share with you my golden rules to help couples to retain and repair connection and manage their reactivity. And lastly, we're going to discuss some behavioral strategies that will enhance your relationships. And there's also some selected resources later on, which um, I will share with you. So let's talk a little bit about how ADHD impacts relationships. At home, of course, you're impacted um, by how you relate to your spouse and your children, and at work, how you are in relation with supervisors and colleagues, and as well in your social life, personally, with your friends. And all of those can be problematic, as many of you are aware. So it's important to become more aware of how your ADHD behaviors may impact others, and then to develop effective strategies to manage them and to educate yourself and your loved ones around you and your family and friends about ADHD so that they do not misattribute 
your behavior um, to something that's not really what it means. Like if you're late, it doesn't mean you don't care. Or if you forget their birthday, it doesn't mean that they're not important to you and things like that. So let's move forward then in talking about some of the research about what it's like um, with couples that have ADHD and one or both partners versus no ADHD. The research has found that there are poor marital adjustment and family functioning. Um, there is poor marital adjustment and poorer family functioning in these couples. There are more negative ratings in areas of communication and affective or emotional involvement um, in their roles and in problem solving. And that 96% of spouses reported that the ADHD member's behavior interfered with functioning in one, at least one of these domains of the general household organization and time management, the child rearing, and the communication within their relationship. And 92% of spouses reported compensating for ADHD spouses in these areas. So it does place often a bigger burden on the non-ADD spouse, if there is one, to carry more of the burden of organizing and managing the household and the family. The ADHD adults tend to, tend to hold more negative perceptions of their marriages and families than their spouses did, even though the spouse may carry more of the burden. Uh, ADHD is also associated with high ratings of marital discord, separation, and or divorce, and that's been found pretty consistently in the research over a number of years. So here are some of the behaviors that can get in the way of healthy and effective relationships. Low self-esteem is often underlying ADHD for many people because of all the negative struggles and messages they have received in their lifetime. So sometimes they don't assert themselves enough. Um, they sometimes settle. Um, they feel a lot of shame or guilt and things like that can get in the way. Um, executive dysfunction, of course, is a big issue because it is important that one can be organized and not be too forgetful and manage time relatively well, especially if you have children and have to pick them up and manage their lives as well as your own. And it results in a lot of lost items and missed events and lateness and unpaid bills and all of that, which decays trust in the relationship. And then there is the habits of self-stimulation that can get in the way. So people tend to want to have the last word and it can be argumentative or they get hooked into devices or television a lot trying to chase stimulation for themselves. And that can get in the way of a relationship and a family life. And then communication problems such as interrupting or only hearing part of what was said because they were distracted or failing to communicate and or speaking over their spouse. So those are just some of the ways that ADHD behaviors can impact your spouse. There's also the emotional dysregulation. So some people can become overly sensitive and reactive and are prone to outbursts or moodiness or um, short-temperedness, and they can sometimes feel easily hurt or offended or criticized. And then there are those who have impulsivity that might take risky actions and make poor decisions or spend too much or commit to too many things and do so without consulting your spouse. And then many others have some sort of poor insight and inability to really observe themselves, which can get in the way of problem solving and leads to some denial and blaming and poor coping skills. And unfortunately, many are considered self-involved or even self-absorbed and difficult to please. Um, and that can be more challenging to manage as well. Low person, interpersonal sensitivity and empathy is often found and low emotional intimacy. So that sort of hypersensitivity and emotional difficulty with intimacy can certainly get in the way for spousal communication and connection. And then the reactive aggression or irritability that can be played out within the marriage as well as within the, ch the child-parent relationship. And sometimes it's hard for some with ADHD to compromise and to cooperate and to make transitions. All of that is sort of a bit of a rigid style that some people have. And others are more passive and conflict avoidant, so they may feel unable to keep up in heated conversations, so they kind of check out or stonewall. And of course, all these things will impact the marriage. And one of the biggest things that we run into is people who have ADD find that their behaviors are misunderstood by others. 
and they are considered as selfish or they don't care or they're lazy or thoughtless. And these, you know, really are not the motive underlying what's going on. It's just their absent-mindedness or lack of organization or their uh, time management issues. And so all of these communication and relationship skills deficits create communication challenges and erode trust in the relationship often because there is a lot of failure to follow through and the non-ADD spouse or the other person can feel very much burdened and not be able to rely on the ADHD partner to follow through. And the uh, burdened spouse can feel unimportant and not valued over time. So that's a very common dynamic that I see in the couples that I treat. I do treat individuals as well as many couples with ADHD and have um, found some of these issues to be particularly difficult. And this dance kind of explains some of the dysfunction that we see in couples. Uh, Gina Perra and Art Robin uh, edited a book recently for clinicians on treating couples with ADHD. And I author the chapter on Imago Relationship Therapy, which we will go into soon. But this is how they describe the dysfunctional ADHD dance. And I thought it was well de described. So generally, a, a non-ADD spouse will try to make sense of their partner's erratic behavior, take on an unfair share of the responsibilities, feeling overburdened, unseen, and unimportant, which will lead them to feel helpless, hurt, and often exhausted. So this leads them to become nagging and critical and perhaps controlling, hypervigilant, hypercritical, etc. Or they may cry, yell, detach, plead, you know, etc. to to manage it all. And so then what happens is that the ADD related behavior occurs, let's say your spouse is late or forgot something important, the partner reacts counterproductively. So assuming again the motive that is intentional rather than unintentional and then the ADHD partner will escalate because they feel criticized and retaliate or feel rejected. So I'm thinking some of you might be familiar with that cycle. Um, so one of the things we have to do initially is to help make sure that that the ADHD member of the couple or both if they both have ADHD are functioning to the best of their abilities. And that means that sometimes they need help first to manage their ADD, such as restructuring their environments and their habits um, and other ways that they can support their executive functioning, whether it's medication or just optimizing their sleep and exercise and diet. Um, so all of these things are really important in making sure that the person with ADHD is more able to benefit from some of the strategies and better able to communicate in the relationship. So jointly educating couples is really important to help them understand the neurology of ADHD and how it impacts the relationship so that they don't misattribute the ADHD members' behaviors and they can help work with them collaboratively rather than being in conflict. Um, and what I have found is that probably 80% of the time, now this is not official in the research, but this is in my clinical experience, I would say 80% of the time when a couple comes to me for treatment and one of them has been identified as having ADHD, that I look more closely at the partner and I find that they have a variant of ADHD as well, often with an opposite presentation. So for example, if one partner is more absent-minded or scattered and spacey, the other might be more obviously organized and very almost, to use a majority of term anal in the sense of being somewhat rigidly organized and compensatory to manage the anxiety of having their ADD. So they tend to look much more functional and less ADD because they're very orderly and have kind of on top of everything, make a lot of lists and, and plan and um, sort of act like they're in control, but it's really a way to mask or treat or compensate for an underlying difficulty with their executive functioning. So sometimes I do find that we have to then diagnose and treat the spouse before we can move forward. And then here are some of the core beliefs that ADHD adults often have, which can, which can get in the way of them feeling good and communicating well in the relationship. Many of them do not rely on themselves because they realize that they let themselves down as well as their partner, that they feel like a failure 
because they've had a lot of um, unmet expectations um, and failures for themselves as well as others. They tend to feel sometimes incompetent and unstable and a lot of chaos and turmoil that surrounds them. And sometimes they feel dependent on others to help them kind of stay on track. And they feel defective or ashamed. So these are some of the things that have been found in the research to underlie the sort of belief system of people with ADHD. All right, so that's sort of the uh, background information I wanted to make sure to cover as we approach now how to use the couples dialogue from Imago Relationship Therapy to facilitate effective communication and listening so that partners can collaboratively work together more effectively. It was originally developed by a psychologist by the name of Harville Hendricks and his wife, Helen LaKelly Hunt, and it was popularized in a book called Getting the Love You Want, A Guide for Couples. I still recommend it, and it's still very valuable as a basic guide to, if for any couple really, ADD or not, um, to understand the dynamics and how the, um, the kind of conflict that couples get into can be sort of it, um, remedied or made into a more conscious process, which I'll get more into. So the focus of this approach is to create emotional safety so that each member of the couple can lower their defenses and also their reactivity and connect to your spouse with empathy and understanding and making sense of the other person's world. We all sort of live in different worlds and part of being in a relationship is to take the time and energy to make sense of our partner and really understand where they're coming from. So the basic dialoguing process and principles can be used by couples at home, even if they're not in therapy. So that's why I'm sharing them with you, even though it would be better if it was facilitated by a professional. There are home-based videos and workbooks as well, and couples weekend workshops available all over the country and internationally, if anyone wants to pursue this work further. So the overview of it is the word imago is the word for image in Latin. And it refers to the idea that we hold an unconscious image of our caretakers, usually our parents, in our minds, in the old brain. And I'll explain what that means in a minute, um, both with their positive and negative qualities. So we instinctively are attracted to a partner who is somewhat similar to our parents so that we can heal the issues from childhood and get what we need from our current relationship to finish our development. And as you may be aware, we have sort of three levels of brain. The original reptilian brain is sort of our survival brain where it just does our breathing and digesting and our heart rate and all that kind of thing is managed from that part of the brain. It's also our fight flight system. So it will let us know if something is dangerous and we can either flee or fight or freeze or hide or submit. But if it's safe, then we are freed up to play to nurture, to mate, to work, or to be creative. Now this old brain and the, limbic, in the, and the limbic system, which is the emotional brain together, are, are the unconscious. So a lot of traumas, deprivations, frustrations, injuries from childhood are stored in that part of our brain. And there's no sense of time here. So what is happening in the present can tr trigger intense reactions in relationships, even though it's based on old experiences. So the couple will learn how to understand the ways that they inadvertently touch each other's wounds or sore spots, if you will, and learn to develop empathy for one another's pain or triggers as they work towards growing together. So the goal is to create emotional safety so that growth can be promoted and to move from that unconscious, reactive, defensive, instinctive pattern that we created in childhood as a self-protective mechanism, but to move from that to a more conscious relationship. So that unconscious go-to place we, we all have keeps us from getting our needs met. And it keeps us from growing into a conscious understanding and stretching into areas that were less well-developed in our childhoods. So one of the dynamics I explain to all couples, which can be really helpful, is that generally there are partners um, that have are drawn to each other with opposite ways of of kind of showing their energy in the world. So half of us are what we call tigers. We maximize our energy outwardly. We kind of 
are more intense and go after our partner for connection. And we kind of want to kind of pursue them and try to resolve the problem and get connected again and, and make it okay. And then the other half of us are the turtles. We tend to minimize or withdraw our energy when we feel unsafe and fear being sort of smothered or threatened or overwhelmed by the other person's emotions. So the turtles will, will withdraw into sort of their shell metaphorically as a way to feel safer. And that, of course, backfires because what happens then is, if you think about it, as the turtle is withdrawing, the tiger is feeling abandoned and goes after the turtle even more for connection, and the tur which in turn terrifies the turtle more into withdrawal. So neither of them are getting their needs met. And this is unfortunately the go-to place for almost all couples. So it's important that people understand that the, the way that they instinctively respond when they feel uncomfortable, hurt, threatened, unappreciated, is actually going to backfire on them getting their needs met. So I work with them on how to turn that into a conscious request for what they want and a more conscious awareness of the fact that this partner is not trying to hurt them or scare them, but merely um, reacting from their own place of fear. So once I explain the dynamic, um, we identify who is the tiger, tiger and who is the turtle. And sometimes that can switch, but generally it, it's pretty consistent. And I also explain that we tend to be attracted to partners who have opposite areas um, of expression or development um, and kind of two halves complete a whole. But often the very thing that we are attracted to about them is the thing that got cut off in our own development and which is uncomfortable for us to kind of go there with them. So then we get into the power struggle. So for example, if you have one partner who's very emotionally expressive and comfortable talking about their feelings, they um, will attract a partner who tends to be more closed down and uncomfortable expressing themselves emotionally because of messages they received as a child about that. And so it's attractive to them because this person who's very emotionally available and expressive is appealing, but when they're then pulled on to be ex emotionally expressive themselves, they feel very uncomfortable. And so that's sort of an ex example of how that dynamic can work. And yet you wonder why would nature attract two incompatible people? But there's actually a win-win, which is where we try to go in the session to the point where uh, you learn to create the safety through the couple's dialogue in order to take the risk to grow the part of you that needs to be stretched into in order to meet your partner's need while growing yourself at the same time. So this power struggle phase is often where couples come to me in and they get triggered more easily, they are very frustrated, um, and it can lead to a very sort of conflictual problematic stage of the relationship where there are some exits that happen. And exits are ways in which you take your energy out of the relationship. So staying at work longer, having an affair, uh, kind of hiding behind the set of the TV or the gaming device, or just kind of leading a parallel life. So I teach couples about how to restore wholeness and create that safety through the couple's dialogue where they can stretch and change and get out of that reactive old brain that gets them stuck in not getting their needs met and in conflict. So the couple's dialogue, which I'm going to teach you in a moment, helps us to feel fully heard and understood and allows us to then sort of stretch into those parts of us that aren't well developed. Our partner actually has the blueprint for our personal growth. So their frustrations with us are the very areas that we need to grow into to both meet their needs and to more fully grow ourselves. So that's the win-win there. So let us move on in how do we do this. So this couples dialogue is a structured approach. So it doesn't feel natural because it's not for a reason. It needs to be honored as a structured approach that creates safety. So it allows us to kind of relax defenses and connect in a deeper way than we might in a normal conversation. 
it then allows that old brain of a part of us to quiet so that we don't keep getting re-injured and reactive. So it's very ADD friendly because it slows the process down, it provides structure, it reduces reactivity and defensiveness, and it helps the listener to be fully present so the sender can be fully heard. It enhances attunement, intimacy, and empathic connection, and it facilitates understanding and problem solving. So it's a three-step process where there is first the mirroring part, then validating, and then empathizing. The couple members face one another and are seated in as close proximity as feasible while maintaining eye contact as much as possible. Couple members will take turns expressing a frustration, a concern, or a request while the other listens actively and with empathy, putting aside their own reactions, even if they get triggered by what their partner is saying or they don't agree with it. It's really important to not respond. So the sender is encouraged to then express the impact of a situation on themselves rather than fo focusing on their partner's actions or blaming them. So in other words, owning their own reaction and trigger. And then the sender is requested to deliver the message in brief segments so as to allow the receiver to hold it in memory and then paraphrase it back. And I remain, remind the receivers to metaphorically put up a plexiglass shield in front of them with a mirror reflecting back what their partner is saying without taking it on themselves, since much of what triggers their partner predates the relationship and has origins in, in your partner's childhood dynamics rather than in the marriage itself. It's just that your, the triggers get inadvertently activated by behaviors of, of the spouse, um, but you didn't cause them. So it's important to kind of not take on your partner's criticisms or complaints or uh, frustrations as being your fault. It's just that you've inadvertently triggered their own sore spot, so to speak. So when the listener is mirroring back their partner, they would neutrally reflect back what the partner just said without adding to it, reacting to it, interpreting it, or editing it. Editing it. So they would say something like, um, I heard you say, or if I got it right, you said, um, and then they would say back what the partner has just told them, and then ask, did I get it? And then make any corrections if they didn't hear it correctly. And then they would ask in a very inviting way, is there more about that? And continue until the partner has gotten it all out. And then the listener would be summarizing sort of in bullet points everything they heard their partner say, and make sure they got it right, did I get it? And then the correction happens if they forgot part of it or they didn't quite get it right, the partner would correct it and then they have to make sure they get it all before moving to validating, which is the second stage. This is when you make sense of the other person's world. I can see how you would see it that way. It's not agreeing, and, but it's just letting the other person know that you can understand their experience. So it makes sense to me because, or I understand that because. And then the third stage is empathizing. This involves putting yourself in the other person's place and imagining what that person is feeling such as, I imagine that must make you feel disrespected, devalued, hurt. And you pick three words like that to describe how you think they're feeling. And then ask if you got it right and see if it resonates for your partner, and then they'll correct you if it doesn't. And then you would switch roles. So that's sort of it in a nutshell. And then there are variations of it and some rules of engagement that I'm going to go over. So. You don't want to engage in this dialogue when one partner is angry, upset, or emotionally unavailable because they can't fully be present and it wouldn't be productive. You must also ask if your partner is available and ask, you know, to have the dialogue, are you available? And you want to agree to be available as soon as possible after your partner requests it because you don't want to put them off. However, if you're not in a good mental space, you do need to take the time to get there, hopefully within the hour. You want to then use a timeout process if the dialogue escalates. So if it gets violated in some way by one um, or the other partner, you want to interrupt it, calm down your, your neurology, if you will, take some deep breaths, and then start again or reconvene again when people are both calm. You want to avoid criticizing, shaming, name calling, or insulting ever. And that goes, of course, to any time you are engaging with your partner, but especially in the dialogue. And you don't want to ever violate the dialogue and just 
interject something because it will no longer feel safe if you do that. You want to also avoid using absolutes such as you always do this or you never do that. And because of ADD brains being notoriously um, less able to hold lots of information in mind at once, it might be useful to have a pad available to jot down some brief notes as your partner is speaking if you're afraid you're going to forget it. So I'm going to talk about some specific short dialogues that are kind of nice ones to start with. This one's called the Appreciations Dialogue. Here, each partner expresses an appreciation for specific behaviors, and then their partner mirrors it back. Then the reason the partner appreciates the behavior and the impact on them is also mirrored. This emphasizes the positive efforts each partner has made and is very connecting to start off with. Um, so it's especially important to share appreciations for behaviors that you have asked your partner to stretch into, just to recognize their efforts. So here's a sample dialogue to give you a sense of what it would be like. So Paul would say, I really appreciate you, your being affectionate with me over the weekend and initiating sex. Tina, so you really appreciated that I was affectionate and pulled you into the bedroom for sex. Paul, yes, because when you do that, I feel loved and cared for. Tina, so when I'm affectionate and when I initiate sex, you feel I care about you and love you. Paul, yes, you got it. Thank you. So there is just an example of how you can use that appreciations dialogue to just honor uh, your partner's efforts to do something that really hit you. We call that your care button, sort of that place where you feel loved and appreciated. And it's important to remember to share that with your partner. So here is a caring behaviors dialogue. And I use this to help couples to connect and re-romanticize re their relationship since increasing pleasure and connection also increases safety. So each member of a couple would list specific behaviors that make them feel loved and cared for by their partner. For example, I feel loved and cared for when you bring me a cup of coffee in the morning or when you greet me at the door when I come home from work. The couple would then take turns sharing their list with each other and telling their partner how that behavior impacts them and then they mirror one another. So it's a great way to remind one another about these behaviors, to re-romanticize the relationship and focus the energy on building positive experiences. Partners are then encouraged to share their list, make a copy and give it to your partner and keep them accessible and make it a conscious effort every day to at least do one or two of the behaviors on that list. So I get couples to post it somewhere they're going to see, like on their bathroom mirror or their closet door so they can see their partner's caring behaviors list on a daily basis until it becomes habit. So here is a sample caring behavior dialogue. Tina, I feel loved and cared about when you call me from work just to ask how I am doing. Paul, you feel loved and cared for when I phone from work because I am thinking about you. Did I get it? Tina, yes. When you do that, I feel valued by you. Paul, so when I call to say hi, you feel that I value you that you are important to me. Did I get it? Yes, you got it. So there's just a brief example of how you can do the, couple, the caring behaviors dialogue so that once you have your list, you would share it with your partner one at a time and take turns. And then the third one I want to share with you is called a behavior change request dialogue. Here is where you can specifically ask for a behavior change. So it teaches couples to change their frustration into a positive desire, which is much more easily heard by the partner. So the frustration might be, I hate when you are late, and the desire would be, I want you to be on time. So the specific request would be, I would like you to be home within 15 minutes of the time you say you will be home. If you're going to be later than that, please call me and let me know. I would like you to do that 80% of the time. So this is a positive measurable request that can then be given as a gift by the, by the other partner. Giving this gift will stretch the partner to grow into areas that got cut off in childhood and will be a challenge to them. So it's often challenging for people with ADHD to be on time. So it is something they have to grow into. Um, so basically the steps are to share a frustrating event or situation with your partner 
to express how you feel about it, how it impacts you. Describe what you do behaviorally when that happens. Reveal what the fear is behind that response. Share your hidden desire. And then request three specific measurable behaviors that would meet that desire from which your partner can select one to give you as a gift. And then the receiving partner would mirror each of the steps, summarize it, validate it, and empathize, just like we did earlier. So I'm going to give you a sample of this process as well in a moment. So each partner's behavior change requests are blueprints for their partner's growth, creating a win-win situation, as I alluded to before. But they're always the hardest behaviors for their partner to do, as they require taking the risk to do something uncomfortable based on past experiences in their childhood. So the goal is to create sufficient emotional safety so that it feels less risky to stretch into these new behaviors. So it's important to remember this so that the person requesting the change does not take it personally when their partner struggles to give them what they're requesting. It's not because you're not important enough to them. It's not because they don't care. It's because it's very difficult to stretch themselves into that new behavior. So here's a behavior change request dialogue. Paul, when I see piles of paper and clutter on most of the surfaces in our house, I feel unnerved and overwhelmed. Tina, so you get really frustrated and bothered when I leave stuff on surfaces. Did I get it? Paul, yes, you got it. It makes me think that you don't respect me and my need for clear surfaces so I can function. To me, it means you don't consider me important enough to make an effort to keep at least the kitchen counter clear, even though I have asked you to do so many times. Tina, so you experience my clutter as my being disrespectful and that you are not important to me. Wow, I didn't realize that. Paul, yes, you got it. And how I usually react is I yell at you. I nitpick and I call you a slob. Tina, you react by yelling at me, picking at me, and calling me a slob. Is that it? Paul, yes. And what I fear most is losing or forgetting something under the debris, like a bill or an important paper or an item. Clutter really scrambles my ADD brain, so I can't even think straight, and that's really scary. Tina, you want me to understand how nerve-wracking it is for you when the clutter increases the risk of losing or forgetting about something important. Did I get it? Paul. Yes, you got it. Tina, you make sense to me because I see the effort you put into staying on top of things. I imagine that you feel worried and hurt that I'm making it even harder for you. Did I get it? Paul, you got me. Paul would then make three specific behavioral requests to Tina to deal with that um, overall need for clear surfaces. And the first request would be spend 10 minutes each day cleaning off the kitchen counter. The second request could be, once a week, clear off all the horizontal surfaces in the living room and bedroom. The third request might be, ask me each day which area of clutter is bothering me the most and agree to clear it then. Tina, the first one is probably the easiest. As a gift, I offer you a clear kitchen counter every day. Paul, thank you, I appreciate that. Tina. After being asked how giving that might help her, she said, it would help me force me to start facing things I tend to put off, like dealing with the mail and newspapers. So that's just an example. And actually, that's taken from my personal life. My ADD husband hates having anything left on the kitchen counter, and I sometimes stack up the newspapers there until I've finished reading them. So, um, but I've seen that with clients as well. So I wanted to share that with you. Um, and then this process is one I also try to get couples to engage in to kind of collaborate together on a shared vision of what they want their relationship to be like. So this process is like a vision board for the marriage to create a goal to work toward until the ideal marriage is attained. So I have each partner separately record their individual vision using a list of we statements like we take walks together three times a week. We are financially secure. We have an enjoyable sex life, etc. Then the partners come together and dialogue about their visions, creating a mutual relationship vision by combining the individual items they both agree upon onto the shared list. And then they post that in a visible place. And that's a really lovely exercise to kind of bring you together in a shared goal for the marriage. And then as I promised, I would share some golden rules for retaining and maintaining connection, as well as repairing ruptures in connection. So as you learn from the dialoguing process, expressing frustrations as requests is really 
much more effective. It's much easier for the partner to hear that than a criticism or a nag or a complaint. So try to get a hold of what your frustration is and language it in a specific request. And then you want to always assume the best about your partner, giving him or her the benefit of the doubt and respond to them from that place. And that's really important to get yourself in that place first when you get triggered to kind of remember, oh yeah, this is not my father who was critical of me or this is not my nagging mother. This is my partner who I love. So you give them the benefit of the doubt that they didn't mean to sound critical or sound demanding that it's just your sore spot that got triggered and makes it feel that way. So assume the best. And then you want to remember to perform the caring behaviors from the list every day and to give appreciations regularly. So sort of catch each other being good, appreciate little things on a regular basis. That really creates a much more positive environment. And then use the couple's dialogue, especially if you need to express a frustration or share something that's sort of more significant a hot issue perhaps. And then it's really important to manage triggers and repair ruptures as they occur. So the person who got triggered can say something like ouch to indicate that they got triggered. And this would serve as a cue for both themselves and their partner, but a cue for themselves to take a breath, kind of calm down their neurology a little bit, remembering that this is not a past person in their life, this is their partner who they love, and then remember to assume the best about their partner and then ask for what they need at that moment as calmly as possible. And I try to remind everybody that we each own our own reactivity. It is not our partner's fault for making us mad or making us hurt or making us disappointed that we own our own reaction. And we have to then take responsibility for turning that into a more effective communication as a request. So here are some um, daily sort of behavioral modifications that I like to recommend to also enhance connection and communication. I like to suggest establishing a couple time each day where the couple has time to maybe linger over dinner after the kids are dismissed if they do have some in the household or go for a walk together or spend 15 minutes before bed connecting without a cell phone or television around. This is so, so crucial to really sort of making the relationship uh, the top priority. Even if you have children, the relationship always comes first because it is out of the strength and connection of the relationship that you can then support the growth of the family and um, sort of you are the foundation of the family. And if, if the relationship is ruptured, then everybody's impacted negatively. So it's important to make the couple come first. And then to set time for weekly planning sessions to go over the, your calendars together, your schedules, and plan ahead for dates or vacations or whatever's going on. You check in with each other and, and plan together. And then plan regular dates. It's really, it can be more fun to have each partner take turns coming up with a fun activity and setting it up once a month. That way you get two dates a month, one initiated by each partner. And the other important thing is to maintain these three daily points of connection. So when the first person leaves the house in the morning, um, go and find your partner and make sure to give them a hug and a kiss um, and wish them a good day. And when the last person comes home in the evening, go and find your partner and connect with them, give them a hug and a kiss and ask them how their day was. And when the first one goes to bed at night, come find your partner and say good night to them. So try to make an effort to do that every day at least those three times. That's really important. Partners also need to collaborate on action plans as a team. The non-ADD partner, if there is one, needs to be part of the plan. So one thing I've recommended is something I call a honey-do board, where you have, for example, a write-on, wipe-off board that the spouse, one of the spouses can put some th up to three things that they would like their partner to do, and the ADD partner would know to look there so that there's not much nagging or sort of follow-up from the, from the spouse, but they know they need to go do those things and check them off. Um, and shared apps like Wonderlist has been really helpful to kind of share taskings and know when the other person has done it. Um, and you can also agree upon cues if you can get help from the less ADD spouse. Um, but it's a collaborative plan. It's not one person having a problem that they have to do all the fixing themselves. 
The non-EDD partner can provide structure and accountability to help their partner to establish these habits, such as going to bed at the same time. Going to bed can be difficult to disengage from stimulating activities like video games or TV or the phone games or apps or YouTube videos. So sometimes a partner who's going to bed at a more reasonable time can kind of gently get the other one uh, to log off um, and to divide responsibilities based on each partner's strengths. So if one of you is, enjoys cooking more, let that person be the cook. If another person doesn't mind the cleaning, let that person do more of the cleaning, that kind of a thing. And if possible, maybe hire out some of the household tasks to alleviate stress on the family, such as a cleaning person or a high school student to come and do homework with your child. However, you can delegate some of that. Um, it can be very helpful. And then giving each other surprises. That makes the other person feel special, thought about, or valued. And these surprises need to be meaningful to your partner. So listen for little hints about what is important to them. It doesn't have to be expensive. It could be little things like a love note or a text in the middle of the day saying, I'm thinking about you, have a good day, or maybe a pair of earrings they noticed, or a ticket to their favorite um, musical group. And I ask people to ask themselves each morning as they wake up, how can I be a better partner today? That needs to be the first thought because in your relationship, it's so important to make that your priority. Each partner needs to take care of themselves to reduce stress and enhance their own well-being. So you each need proper sleep, exercise, nutrition, and if you take medication, to take the medications you need for your ADD, anxiety, or depression. Um, so self-care is really imperative. And one of the things I've been working a lot with clients on lately is to have everybody leave their cell phones in the charging stations in the kitchen and not take them to the bedrooms. So you have more time to connect in the bedroom without that, and it's easier to sleep and have a good restful night, which helps your brain work better and everything go better for your day. So those are all some modifications that can be helpful. So here's a few resources I put together for those of you that might like to look further into some of these things, some books um, and uh, some websites, including where you can look for the Couples Weekend Workshops through Imago Relationship International. Um, and so those are available for your resources. And I mentioned Wonderlist, which is a wonderful app you can share with a partner or even a child. Um, so for groceries or different household projects, you can use that. Um, there's an app called Rescue Time that allows you to track all of your online activities and set goals if you have problems with spending too much time online. And Freedom blocks you from the internet at designated times, and you can use it on your phone as well. And then Mint is a, a helpful one for managing finances if that's an issue in the relationship. So those are just some helpful apps for couples. All right, and that's all the content for now. I am open for questions. I'm not sure what's happening. I haven't heard any questions yet.
Okay. Thank you, Dr. Robbins, for your presentation. I apologize. We seem to have a technical uh, problem that's, that's happening with our sound system. User error, actually. <laughs> I'm here. Hopefully, everyone can hear me now. All Dr. right. Robbins. I can hear you. Excellent. Dr. Robbins, your presentation was very insightful, and you've given us some great information. The floor is now open for questions, and the first one comes from Laura. She says, what would you recommend to a family where both uh, the couple 